Uh, first name, so I commend you for attempting there. Uh, my name is Shaigan Abi Shafi. I'm here from Lids at MIT to present the Castle Architecture of the Cross Modal Attentive Skill Learner. This is joint work with Dong Kim, Jason Poshis, and John Howe. So before I start, I just wanted to share a video with you that I found interesting. This is footage of a human trying to set a speed record on the game Super Meat Boy. Now, for those not familiar with this game, it's a platform style game where the objective is to reach the other side of the screen while avoiding these deadly obstacles. And it's known to be a rather fast-paced and challenging game. And the player is doing quite well here, uh, but the most interesting part of this video is that he's not getting any visual feedback from the game. In fact, he's blindfolded. So how is he doing this? Well, it's a combination of things. Firstly, there's a lot of timing and memorization involved. Next, he's of course exploiting some of the geometric constraints of the game. For instance, running the agent into walls or boundaries to control its state without getting any of the visual feedback. And then finally, and I think most critically, audio plays a key role here. So the player anticipates key audio cues and then uses them to set up chains of temporally extended actions and then repeats this whole process until reaching the final goal. So given this video, we asked ourselves, in situations when we have sparse rewards and very few supervisory signals that can help us achieve our goal, why don't we try to use all available sensory signals to achieve our task in our own? Now, how does this relate to hierarchical reinforcement learning? If we think of HRL as conducting problem decomposition or dimensionality reduction, with a large body of work in the past focused on reducing dimensions of time, for instance, by reducing decision costs or learning temporally extended actions, this work instead focuses on reduction in the dimensions of both time and sensory modalities. Specifically, our goal is to learn options that attend to and exploit pertinent cross-modal signals at the right moment for us to achieve our task. But this is very challenging because as we add more and more sensors, the agent has to work harder to find these correlations between these sensory signals and the reward it's getting back from the environment. So the main goal is, or the main challenge rather, is how do we process this cross-modal information in a sample-efficient manner? The way we do this is through attention, cross-modal attention. So we can compute an attention feature vector using both exogenous and endogenous features. So exogenous features in this case, over the sensory inputs we're showing here, which are audio and video, are salient features of the domain. For instance, in audio, we might have a loud band, or in video, we might have a large, fast-moving object coming towards the agent. And that's something that should capture the agent's attention. Whereas endogenous attention is a function of the agent's hidden state, something that compresses its notion of belief or its long-term goals or intents. Now, using this attention vector uh, features, we can compute an attention vector over these sensory modalities and then compute an attended feature input, either using summation or concatenation. We then pass these into a recurrent net, such as an LSTM, and we, because we're interested here in parsing the local domains, and we can compute our options over this. So specifically, we compute option value functions, intro option policies pi, and our option termination functions that tell us when to terminate options. We train this entire thing using backprop through time uh, via the asynchronous advantage option credit framework, or the A2OC framework that was recently introduced. And one minor detail here is that now because the hidden state of the agent not only touches the LSTM there, but also goes into the attention vector, we have to be a little bit careful with how we do backprop. Okay, so we evaluated this framework on a variety of domains, some of which uh, some of which didn't even need audio to achieve the online task. So this is one of those domains. We have a door puzzle domain where the agent spawns in a room with two doors. There's a key in the middle of the room with a, with a key color observable and indicating the correct door. So all the agent has to do is figure out that it has to pick up the key, remember the key color because the key disappears after that point, and then open the correct door. We play a little bit of audio near the key, but it doesn't actually need to be used in terms of solving the task, of course, because it can observe the key color. So first we compare against the baseline of just using video options and LSTMs. And we see that the agent converges into a reasonable policy about after 40,000 episodes. And then interestingly, once we add audio, it actually takes the agent much longer to learn a task. And what we think is happening here is that it's just essentially becoming over encumbered in terms of finding the correlations between video, audio, and all these sensory modalities to the rewards it's getting back. But as soon as we introduce this notion of cross model attention over our sensory inputs, we dramatically reduce the number of episodes needed to learn a task. We also con considered a transfer learning case where we now randomize the positions of the doors and the key. And we use the pre-trained option from the previous domain. And again, the castle architecture outperforms the rest. But now, if we increase the total number of episodes here from 100,000 episodes to 400,000 episodes, we see that eventually the non-attentive network, which is the one in yellow, catches up to castle. But the main takeaway message is, here is that the cross-model attention accelerates the skilling, learning, and transfer process. So next, we wanted to consider a domain where audio actually plays a key role. So we have a Minecraft-like domain. There are two ores. 
uh, golden iron. Uh, but critically, uh, what we do is in the grayscale visual input of the agent, we replace the sprite of this ore with a single sprite. And the agent has to figure out what the correct tool is, the shovel or pickaxe, to, to mine this ore. So because of this, what it has to do is go near the ore, interact with it, get some unique audio features, remember these audio features, and then use them to pick the correct tool type. So what we're visualizing here is the evolution of attention in a single episode, with the video frames shown on top, and the audio frames, this audio spectrogram shown on the bottom, and the audio and video attention shown in the center. So interestingly, the audio attention is positive, and it gets higher and higher as the agent gets closer to the ore. And once it gets that useful audio information at time step six in the middle, uh, it sets the audio attention to zero, which is great because it knows that it's extracted all the useful audio information it needs from the domain, and it doesn't need to pay attention to audio. On the other hand, this is a little bit disconcerting because why does it pay any attention to audio before time step six at all? Six at all? Why doesn't it recognize that that's all just noise coming into it? So does this mean that it's storing noisy information into its LSTM memory? And is it making inefficient usage of its finite size memory? So to, in, to um, analyze this a bit deeper, we have to take a look at our LSTM activation functions. So on the top, we're showing the forget gate activation, and on the bottom, we're showing the input gate activation. And recall that when forget gate is zero, it's, it means more forgetting. When input gate is one, it means more input throughput. So critically, we see something interesting here, which is at time step six, we have this rewriting event. So maybe the agent is not actually writing any of the audio until that critical time step six. But we want to dig in a little bit deeper, and it turns out with concatenated attention, we can actually decompose the contribution of audio and video, hidden state and bias, to both of these activations. So by the way, these are average activation functions. So now the story is clear. So despite the fact that the audio is being attended prior to time step six, it's not actually being used to write anything to LSTM memory. So the agent is not actually wasting any of its memory in terms of audio. Rather, the attention is acting as a pre-filter that tells the LSTM, hey, there might be something useful in the, in, in the audio, but you can make the final call in terms of storing or not storing. So next, we really, really wanted to test this on uh, Atari 2600 games, but unfortunately, it turns out that ALE doesn't support audio queries. So we actually added it ourselves. I'm going to pull the press as soon so that people can make use of this. So here we're showing some footage of the game Avatar, which is a Pac-Man style game. On the top we have uh, the audio attention being shown over a thousand frames, and then we're zooming in into the video uh, uh, for about 10 time, time frames or so. Uh, and again, we see this kind of anticipatory attention. The attention increases and then it goes back down to zero once we get the audio information. And on the bottom of the table, we're showing that we're beating the score of DQN A through C and GA through C. And one major note here is that they're only using video. We're using both audio and video. Um, we also beat the score, so here we, we actually didn't train with options, we just trained with pure cross-modal attention over the audio video. But we were still able to beat the score of A2OC, which is a hierarchical framework. We weren't able to beat the score of fun or feudal networks, but we're thinking that there's a lot of uh, combination of ideas here that can be combined with, with fun networks to, to get an even higher score. Okay, so in conclusion, what we've done here is we've introduced this notion of cross-modal attention into HRL. And we've shown in several domains that it reduces sound complexity and even improves final performance sometimes. We think that this has many applications, for instance, in space robotics when we have limited computation or storage, or autonomous cars when we have many sensors all around us, or naturally distributed sensor systems. So I hope you've enjoyed the talk. We have an extended version of the paper on archive, and the code is open for people to use. So I hope to, to make use of it. Thanks so much.